I think I'm live. Can you guys hear me? I think you can. I'm going to uh, check in what's going on here. See who's online. So I figured I'd do a live stream. Uh, I just felt inspired. It's not going to be too long because it's Friday night, but um, here we are. What's going on here? All right. I'll see how many people can actually show up. I'm not expecting too many people. Give them, given it's Friday night, but yeah, you never know. I was curious to find out. I'm going to mute this. All right. So we're going to give it a few minutes, see how many people actually get on, and then we'll take it from there. I have a subject of the day, and uh, then I'll do a little Q&A. I'll take it from there. Hello, Hamza. How are you? Good, good, good. Are people are coming on. It's weird. As soon as I went live, everybody got, uh, everybody jumped on. I guess nobody got the notice before. About 10 minutes ago, I put out a notice on YouTube to say, hey, um, you know, I knew you were a wizard lizard. <laughs> I knew you were a wizard. There we go. Mm, Hamza, I remember you, Hamza. Uh, I can't speak of my age. I uh, hope everybody's good. Friday night, uh, my city is in lockdown, so we can't go out. So I figure it's a good night to do a little live stream. Why not, right? See how everybody's doing. So everybody is doing well. Good evening, Glenn from New York, if I recall. Yeah, yeah, motivation time. Dan, how are you, Dan? Glenn, I hope everybody is well. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, I'm waiting for a few more people to get on. We'll try to get like to uh, 50, 60 people. When did you guys get the notifications? Because uh, I had put this on YouTube. I had uh, scheduled it about 10 minutes ago. Did any of you get a notification prior to that? Uh, greetings, Nicaragua. Very cool. Hello, Madame Zorbas, my Greek friend. I was watching Jurassic Park just now. There you go. I'm trying to figure out a joke to make about Jurassic Park. Anyway, Jurassic Park, great movie, yeah. I remember when that came out, I saw it two, three times just to see the T-Rex scene. You're 169 years old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But on my online dating profile, I only I say when I'm 99. Uh, Brisbane, Australia, Saturday morning. Oh, very cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, too bad you're in quarantine still. Yeah, yeah. Doing good. Evening from Maine. Good evening from Maine. Ah, uh, very jealous of you, Dan. Love Maine. I love Maine. Um, is it here? You may recognize this. Yeah, it was uh, one of my favorite places. Go to Maine to relax, you know. Uh, Big Apple is doing okay. Just got notification. Really, eh? Yeah, see, there's YouTube. They got to work on their stuff. Yeah, I, I put up, I assume everybody can hear me. If you can't hear me, uh, you let me know. I assume, yeah, of course you can hear me. Um, yeah, I put out the notification like 10 minutes ago. And nobody can, eh. All right, I'm doing pretty good. How, how are you guys doing? I hope it's, I hope you're well. From Argentina, people from all over the world, always a lot of fun. Do I have any Java course? No, I never put out a Java course, which is kind of funny because Java is my favorite language of all time, um, just from a personal standpoint, you know. But um, you know, what's going on here? It's not what I want to see. Okay, there we go. Yeah, here's a, a shot from, uh, I think this is the main shot here. Unmute that. So I think you guys can hear me. So I, this is my little trip in Maine uh, about a year ago. Love Maine. Uh, yeah, hopefully when the border moves up, uh, opens up, I'll go back there. Anyway, so let's go back. So um, I got a quick little subject I want to bring up. Right. Ethiopia. Very cool. Wow. Do you like donuts? Love donuts, but uh, I'm on a strict, well, fairly strict, uh, carb-free diet. 
I'm reducing my carbs quite a bit just to get my weight down. So that's uh, Stefan. When when you are older, what are you planning to do in life? <laughs> um, I like what I do. This is uh, my business in education, whether it be with the schools, uh, retail sales, and, uh, and YouTube streaming. This is as much a hobby for me as it is anything else. Uh, I like it's fun. It's fun. I come from a family of teachers, by the way. My father was a teacher. Seven or six or seven, of my cousins are teachers. Uh, six or seven, of my aunts and uncles are teachers. So it's kind of in the blood to to want to uh, help people understand complexity. We hear you loud and clear. Thanks for letting me know. That's good. I implemented or I put into one of my mics this mic here. So this mic is a lot easier for my camera to drive. So we get a much louder signal. So it's clear for everybody. It's good. It's good. It's good. All right. So um, what's going on? Okay, 50 people. Uh, awesome. Nature in Maine is great for breaks away from programming. Indeed. I can imagine. Head, head down to the coast, right? Soak in some of the ocean. I like cold ocean. The cold, C-O-L-D, ocean has a certain um, calmness to it. I want to stop LL and learn coding. It's hard. I wanted to stop LL and learn coding. It's hard. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Mm. Uh, let's see. We've got a question. I'll answer a few questions. I did your IW freelance course and freelance course. I have my website up and able to read PHP, but can't write it. Is that, that bad? No, 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 no. You just got to write it. You got to... You, you got to just force yourself to write the code. And even if you don't understand the code at first, the act of actually writing the code, and uh, even if you don't understand it, it's going to help your brain to assimilate the knowledge. Trust me, just write code, write code. And one day you wake up and you go, I understand. And it'll become like writing English, if English is your first language. Mm. Let's see, let's see. Sounds good in Gotham. Yeah, you know, of course, New York is Gotham, you know. That's what it's modeled after, I'm sure. Great place, New York City. Why do people hate Ruby? Because I told people to hate Ruby. No, I don't know. You know how it is with technology. Technology is, is um, it's kind of like disco music in the sense that in technology, every few years, new group of developers come into the game. And there's in inclinations uh, with younger people, especially, to want to do the new. And uh, so when people jump on to one camp, they feel it's in our brains, the way our brains work. If you're in one camp, if you're for one team, Team Python, then your brain will literally start giving you a negative impression about the other teams out there, Team Java, JavaScript, Ruby especially. And... It's just the way, that's the way people are. You think about the battles you see in the world, like people used to fight over Mac versus Windows. You don't see that so much these days. That's kind of calmed down. But for years, it was a huge battles: Mac versus Windows or Android versus um, iOS, etc. And people get very emotional, some people anyway, get very personal, personal, uh, personal about it. They're, they're personally invested in the technology that they buy. But if you learn... To get above that and you start thinking, well, you know, whether I use Windows or Mac, Ruby or Python, JavaScript or PHP, uh, it's it's all just tools, man. It doesn't really matter. You just do whatever is good for you, you know? How to stay motivated? Well, if you're not feeling it one day, I say just do the 20-minute rule. Steph's 20-minute rule. No matter what you do, you have to do 20 minutes a day. 20 minutes is easy to do, right? Just do 20 minutes a day. And um, oftentimes when you sit down to do 20 minutes, it ends up being 40 minutes, 50 minutes. But if you do even just do that 20 minutes where it's really painful, you're like, ah, I can't take this. Just do the 20 minutes and at least you move the ball forward. As I've taught in many videos, uh, frequency of exposure is far more important than how much actual time you put into it, you know, within reason. So what do I mean by that? The more often that your brain is exposed to something, the more it's going to attribute value to it, the more it's going to invest uh, 
we'll call it uh, CPU cycles, if you will, it, will, it will invest energy into adopting it. So if you expose yourself daily, even just for 20 minutes to coding, your brain will soon learn to accept that coding is important. It will start, it will start um, uh, deploying resources to, to make coding easier for you. So every day, just a little bit, that's how you do it. Let's see what David Garcia says. Hey, Steph, I want to edit someone's website that was built with Wix for money. How do I go about doing that? Like, what should I be asking for in order for me to do the job? Well, first thing you want to do is get access to the Wix backend, right? I know that Wix has an API, an application programming interface. It has a way for you to extend a Wix site way beyond its normal tools. It's JavaScript based. I know I dealt with Wix. I talked to these guys. Um, I've never used Wix, but I've talked to them. They called me up. I think they wanted to do some promotion stuff, and they gave me access to their back end. And from, from what I recall, I just looked at it briefly. It's, it's quite powerful. So first thing you got to do is you got to get access to the Wix site. Now, and see how far they, are, they allow you to extend its, feature, uh, its, uh, its functionality within, with, within the scope of tools, of the tools that Wix does provide. Um, you may find that you can make the changes and the updates for your client uh, within Wix, or you may find you may have to leave Wix. And I would imagine, I'm not sure, there might be an ability to export the site out of Wix. If not, you could just use the browser to copy the site, you know, and then push it somewhere else. Uh, why don't you publish Amazon book with all the answers and questions? Yeah, you know, it's, it's just a factor of time now. It's a question of time. There's a lot of things I like to put out in terms of content on Amazon or whatnot. I, it's a good idea, though. Uh, remember the 2005 hipster Rails developers with their white MacBooks and their loud anti-PHP rhetoric? Indeed, indeed. Yeah, yeah, I was in the middle of that battle back in the day just to uh, have fun getting into the fray. Um, at the end of the day, when I was uh, having fun uh, in the Ruby PHP battles, in the Java battles, um, <laughs> I remember we had developed a, um, a site uh, checking uh, utility uh, uh, software. It was command line based for our internal use, and it was built with Ruby, actually. <laughs> it worked. It worked for that job. It was just a single user, and we wanted, it, we, we wanted to ping, make sure sites were live. So we just developed this thing in Ruby. Uh, are boot camps worth it? Mm, depends, you know, it depends. I think uh, before you go into debt, five, ten thousand, you could try alternatives that are far less expensive and might be as or much more effective. What do you think about the future of ML market, machine learning market? It's huge. Do you think it is possible for me with a bachelor's degree to compete in this market with all the PhD dudes from top universities? Well, the ML market is going to evolve. Right now, we're at the stage, I believe, where it's like the research stage. And you're going to see more and more implementations come out over time as the technology emerge, uh, matures. So, yeah, I think so. Uh, but you got to do your research. No problem, David. No one teaches email development. Do you? Email development. Well, it's just HTML, right? Which is HTML, maybe some CSS, if that's what you think, that's what you're, you're talking about, making emails look good, right? All right, so um, I just want to bring on something that I thought was interesting. It might be interesting for you guys. So we're going to go back, we're going to go way back uh, in the uh, development world when the um, year 1999, the year 1999. And there's, there's a reason for this is going to be relevant for today. So in the year 1999, people started talking about the Y2K bug. Now, the Y2K bug was this uh, bug. People were wondering what would happen to computer systems when they would roll over to the year 2000. A lot of people thought that they might go back to 1900. So people were starting to get really scared, and the media was really running with this. People were worried that planes were going to fall out of the sky and, uh, and zombies were going to take over the world. And, uh, and then huge big companies started developing where they were being rushed in to update software to avoid the, the Y2K uh, 
apocalypse. It was a thing, trust me. I know it sounds silly now, but hmm. it was all over the news. Uh, it was like people said, don't fly on uh, you know January 1999. Don't do it January 1st. It's going to be bad. The trains could fly off the rails. This was a thing. So let me show you a couple of things I found. So the Y2K bug. So here we go. Can everybody see this now? I, think, I imagine so. Let me check this out. All right, what happened to the Y2K square, scare? So the Y2K bug was a computer flaw or bug that may have caused problems when dealing with dates beyond December 31st, 1999. As the year 2000 approached, computer programmers realized that computers might not interpret 00 as 2000, but as 1900. Let me scroll down. Let me scroll. Let me scroll down. Sorry for the whistling, guys. Um, why were people afraid of the year 2000? I'll tell you why people were afraid. Uh, the number one reason people were afraid is because everybody was, a lot of people were hyping the fear. And that's why. So let me go back. The early fears about the year 2000 computer problem featured all sorts of machine driven haywire by their inability to read dates in the year, computer networks that would that control power, water and phone systems would freeze, railroads, airlines and trucks idled as dispatch and traffic safety systems crash, blah, 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 blah. So uh, there was this huge panic. It was a pretty big panic anyway. People were getting into bunkers and stuff. It was pretty remarkable. Uh, so let's go in here. So I, I just want to read this line here. Some experts, let me, uh, you know what, let's see if I can uh, enlarge this for everybody concerned. All right. Some experts who argued that scaremongering was occurring, such as Ross Anderson, professor of security engineering at the University of Cambridge, have since claimed that despite sending out hundreds of press releases about research resulting, re, about research results suggesting that the problem was not likely to be a big problem, as some have suggested, they were largely ignored by the media. They were largely ignored by the media. In a similar vein, the Microsoft Press book running Office 2000 professional published in May 1999 accurately predicted that most computer hardware and software would be unaffected by year 2000 problems. Authors Michael Halvorsen and Michael Young characterized most of the worries as popular hysteria, an opinion echoed by the Microsoft Corporation. So uh, let me take you back in time. So young Steph Nerdling was uh, doing his Java coding back in the day. And I remember when this is all coming up, coming out, and I said, hmm. So I went to my Windows uh, machine. I think it was probably Windows 98. And I just advanced my clock, you know, past 1999. Nothing happened, right? Nothing happened. Anyway, uh, the moral of this story, I just want to point out about how this is part of the whole lizard wizard thing I talk about. Our brains are literally designed to look for threats first and foremost. And if somebody suggests that there's a danger here, our brains will... Um, with enough exposure, will overemphasize this, and we'll start literally believing these things. And let me tell you, year two Y two K was a huge, huge thing. You know, as cited in this uh, Wikipedia article I mentioned, and nothing happened, except a lot of people made a lot of money uh, selling Y two K related services. You know, uh, you know, retrofitting software and so forth like that. So, I just you know, it's just a little lesson. A little lesson, uh, I've seen this happen a few times, the um, fear driven by, uh, by hysteria. So be very careful about when you hear about the doomsday scenarios and so forth as a general rule, um, because the psychological frame, our brains, are literally designed to overemphasize potential threats. That's the whole point of this message. All right, that's it for that. So I thought you'd find that kind of interesting. Okay, I'm going to answer a few more questions, and then we'll call it an evening. Let's see what Jonathan has to say. I still remember that news years vividly, even if I was pretty young at the time. It was very hyped up. Uh-huh. 
A lot of people make money on the hype, though. Do you think you have to go to the biggest university in order to be a good program? Not even close. No, no, not at all. Media making panic? Imagine my shock. Yeah, it's shocking. Does React dominate freelance market? I don't believe so. I don't believe so. I think React now dominates um, the you know, front end JS market, but I don't think it dominates the freelance market. Um, I think when it comes to front end, I don't think uh, any particular JavaScript framework dominates the front end. Uh, in terms of freelance development, it's WordPress PHP, you know, uh, which is not front end, of course. I think though, um, I think in the end, I think you'll find that it's going to be a, a race between React and Vue as, as far as front end is concerned. Yes, but I but it gave us old timer COBOL developers a lot of work with high salary. <laughs> it did indeed. Yeah, it did indeed. <laughs> Why do all programmers look tired? Not enough sun. They don't get enough sun. Yes. Glenn from New York remembers the hysteria. Yeah, yeah, that's the way it is. Do you need to master PHP for a decent WooCommerce WordPress site? No, no, you don't. Just learn the basics and you'll be fine. Uh, can you connect a CMS to your own custom backend? For, for sure. There's many ways you can do it. Depends on the CMS. Some CMS might provide hooks, like uh, WordPress, for example, provides a plugin architecture so you can extend its functionality. Uh, beyond that, uh, with the themes, uh, some themes could be very sophisticated where they provide much more WordPress themes, much more than just a visual component, but also a functional component. And you can just bypass uh, WordPress altogether if you, if you really wanted to. It's not advisable. You could by, let's say, accessing the database yourself, uh, the WordPress database, uh, then grabbing a bunch of data, massaging it, and then sending it back into uh, WordPress as a series of JSON objects, and you would write a plugin to consume those JSON objects. That might be a, a roundabout way of doing that, but for sure. Uh, so I am almost through your fundamentals course, and I will hopefully be putting my own portfolio site up soon. Congratulations. Good work. Good work. The hardest part of learning how to code is just the, it's the first few months, right? Then it gets easier. Why is everyone so hyped up about WordPress? It's not so much I think WordPress is such a great tech in of itself. It's uh, the back end. Last time I look at the code, it's pretty messy. It's just it's got such a huge following. It's huge. It's huge. Um, I don't know. Millions and millions of websites run on WordPress. And a lot of these websites are small businesses. And as a result, that means there's a lot of work for uh, WordPress freelancers. That's it. There's big firms that they just manage WordPress and keeping WordPress up to date. You know? I think the WordPress company, what are they called, Automatic? Yeah, they are, uh, I think it's a billion dollar company and it's privately held, you know? So yeah, again, when you're looking at technology, the, the, the hype of the technology may not be because the technology in of itself is great, but it could be a whole bunch of other factors involved in that as well. I hope that makes sense. Like for example, you know, Mac OS one through nine it wasn't necessarily very well written program software, but especially by today's standards. But the overall product that it offered was really, really good. Even though the back end was, Ugh. and it's not my opinion. Even Steve Jobs said we got to kill it at one point uh, when they went to OS nine, OS nine, no, OS ten, excuse me, from nine, because uh, uh, the old code base just couldn't handle modern computers. So you change the clock on a computer and Fuzz found out, found that, well, let me try that again. Citizen B. Uh, and thus found that no software in all the world would have problems with the change from 1990 to 2000. Sorry, it seems too simplistic to me. That's a good point. But I didn't say all software, but I said uh, all the Windows software. Windows ran fine. Uh, but it really, um, uh, it re you know, I, I just... I, I remember thinking about it at the time, and I was a developer, and I said, it's not going to do much. And uh, I was right. Uh, WordPress ha also has a REST API you can use. Yeah, there you go. Uh, finish your HTML, CS, and JS course this summer and launch my first website. Great course. Thanks. Thanks for letting me know, and, and congratulations for launching your first site. How to start your freelance business when people can just use WordPress? I do freelance course, but I am worried. Ha ha. Well, you can do a lot of free WordPress freelancing. Let me tell you, I know 
several people who have WordPress sites for their businesses, and some of them know how to code, and they, they hire people, like even me. I hire somebody to, uh, to update and manage my, my WordPress sites because I don't, I don't want to do it myself. Good resource for Re React.js. Um, I would just go to the course site. Once you know your basics, you should be able to core docs and just go there. Which hosting service would you recommend? Depends what you want to do. Uh, you know, if you're just doing your basic website, I would just do s standard hosting, you know, for now. Uh, if you want to get a little more sophisticated and very sophisticated, you can go DigitalOcean, but you got to know your way around uh, command line in that situation. I always recommend um, hybrid, hybrid virtual private servers that also provide traditional, easy to use front ends, you know? Alex, love your channel, Steph. I'm glad. Thanks. Thanks for letting me know. I appreciate it. Which back end can I learn to complement my front end? React.js, Laravel, Django, or Node? Look, I always tell people, look where the demand is, you know? Uh, it depends on where you, you know, what are the jobs? What are they looking for in your area? And also consider the type of work you want to do. You know, they're all, they're all good. Those are three of, if I was choosing a web framework, those would be amongst the top three I would be looking at personally. If I recall, we had a bootable three and a half Bootable disk, we had a bootable three and a bootable disk from somebody to check the PC clock for Y2K issues. Yeah, you know what? I think you read about that. It's been a while, but yeah. yeah. Uh, when you say update WordPress sites, what exactly would that involve for the most part? Most of the time, it's, it's just uh, skin issues, uh, updating the themes for people. But it could also be just making sure all the plugins, if they're using plugins, up to date, they're up to date. Uh, maybe you hit a WordPress site that's been hacked because they didn't update a plugin or using a Wimpy plugin. Uh, maybe it's uh, installing new plugins, you know, stuff like that. Hmm. Trust me, it could be tricky. It could be tricky. Uh, what else? Yeah. Do you think learning SEO is essential for web developers? No, no. Web development is uh, SEO is separate things. Although, when you build websites with modern methodologies, which we all do, uh, your sites are by nature very SEO friendly. Also, you know the SEO profession, if you will, if you will came out in the 1990s, early 2000s late 1990s, early, early 2000s really started coming around. And that's because a lot of the websites were just built really pathetically in terms of being transparent to the search engines. You know, flash only websites that had no data that the search engine could search. Um, heavy, image heavy websites with no, you know, information, meta information about the, the, the site. Also, uh, search engines at the time weren't nearly as sophisticated as they are today. Today, search engines can comb through a site and extract so much information. It's not even close to uh, what it was back in the day. So much better now. And also, a lot of uh, what affects rankings and websites today are external factors external to the website. Social media mentions, first and foremost, you know. And I bet you an email mentions as well. You know, Google, a lot of Gmail, right? They're sniffing Gmail. See what people are chatting about in there for sure. Um, yeah. All right, what do we got? Dangers of dependency on cloud-based hosting like W. I don't think there's any dangers there. I think that is safer than anything else. I actually think that uh, storing data on the cloud is safer than storing on local raids. Like for my video backups and stuff, I do have some local backups. Well, my long-term backups are on SkyDrives because if Apple goes down or Google goes down or uh, AWS goes down, that's it. The world's over, you know, because <laughs> they got backups on backups and backups and backups. So if you have all your backups local and your house is, uh, you know, goes on fire or uh, you, you get a burger or somebody, somebody steals all your stuff, you're, you're finished. But the chance of Apple losing the, its data, it's like it's, it's close to zero as you're going to get, right? Uh, what's going on here? Vanilla JavaScript, the best framework. Uh, there's a framework called Vanilla JavaScript, or I don't know. <laughs> 
What do you think about web-based augmented reality for mobile? You know, I saw some, somebody was showing me some of the stuff that they can do now on the web, and it's getting pretty fast. It's all about speed, you know, and accessibility speed. It's getting pretty fast. I still think uh, augmented reality and VR are niche products right now, but it does have a future f for the web. I think the future is always the web because it's cross-platform. It's just a question of the uh, speed bottlenecks, but that every year is, is getting reduced and reduced and reduced. I'm thinking about making my own CMS. Why? It's too easy for any WordPress dev to, to take my clients. It, it's too easy for any WordPress. Oh, so you want to do a little uh, vendor lock-in? Maybe, maybe. But I find that uh, if you really got a good relationship with your clients, you don't need to do that kind of stuff. It's up to you, but it's a big job producing a CMS. I've, we've started building our own. You know, if you use a good uh, framework like Laravel or Django or whatever, uh, Express, you can get a lot done quick, but then there's a lot of stuff that has to be done. Do you have any tips for programmers from abroad that want to work in the U.S.? You got to talk to U.S. companies, see what they're looking for, U.S. consulate. You know, I never had to do that, so I'm not the right person to talk to about that. My wife told me that for a developer, you are an attractive man. <laughs> That's pretty good because you know, developers are known to be stunningly attractive to begin with. Well, tell your wife, thank you. Shared hosting or VPS, and also which provider, AWS Azure, AWS Linode, DigitalOcean. I haven't used Azure, AWS. I know they're all very sophisticated these days. I happen to use DigitalOcean for some of my hosting needs. Uh, shared hosting for simple sites. If you want to start uh, managing... Uh, uh, a large book of clients, I would get a VPS with some sort of control panel so you can start installing people's domains very quickly. That's what I would do. Good morning. 6 a.m. in India. Hey, good morning. All right, cool. How many coding languages do you know? Well, I, I've written commercially, um, meaning I made money or got paid to write software over the years, something like eight, nine languages. Um, most of my active coding work, though, was probably Java, probably Java. But I've done some stuff, some, some really weird things. I've written code in weird languages that nobody uses anymore, and uh, something like uh, very domain-specific languages. Like, for example, I did a... I did my first educational software for uh, a very large pharmaceutical. It was either Pfizer or Avantis. I forget who now. Anyway, I did this software, uh, training software, educational software, to teach doctors how to use one of their drugs. And I actually wanted it in DVD format. That's how far back ago. So at the time, the DVD authoring uh, suite was something called Director, Macromedia Director. Adobe bought it. And, but to do anything, you had to write uh, a lot of code. And I wrote something called, and the coding language was something called Lingo. One of the most verbose, terrible coding languages I've ever used. But it, was, you could, it had object-oriented capabilities, et cetera. Anyway, I had to do it. I had to use it. So I learned Lingo, and I built a pretty sophisticated uh, piece of software with it. Again, for DVD only. That was, uh, but uh, yeah, I done a lot of Java. C sharp work in the past and the .NET, a lot of JavaScript, uh, uh, different fr frameworks, if you will, like classic ASP, uh, uh, yada, 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 PHP, you know. So, again, eight or nine. And then, of course, you know, you, you know, if you're doing any web stuff, you're probably going to be doing SQL, uh, relational database work. Uh, yeah, you know, Perl. Back in the early days, like the early, early 90s, uh, I did per, a little bit of pro CGI. Anyway, let's see what we got here. Uh, how can I manage my college and my web development courses? Sometimes it is difficult to manage. Hmm. Just devote, like I said, you know, since you're paying for college and you got deadlines and stuff, give that the priority for now. And just devote, like, say, I'm just going to do 20 minutes a day of coding minimum. And you can take it from there. Mr. Camacho, what's he saying here? Yo, Steph, do you prefer gaming on PC or console? 
These say console just because it's easy. I know you can get much you know, better gameplay on the PCs, but uh, I'm not a big gamer anymore. I still play a little bit. I got a PS4, um, and I just get on to hang out with some old buddies of mine. Okay, we did that one. All right, question, t tip, question. Tips for good final year university project CS degree. Ah, what I would do is I would approach your professor and see if, what, if they're interested in a particular subsection, right? Man, I don't know, is he interested in Python, you know, and, uh, I don't know web scraping, or is he in, interested in uh, uh, Node and uh, creating microservices? You know, figure out what he might, he or she might be interested in, be, the person who's going to give you the grades. And believe it or not, if they're interested in the subject and you, you build something that they're interested in, they're much more likely they'll give you a higher grade, right? Um... Not that grades gonna matter much once you leave school. Nobody ever asks you what grade you got. Uh, okay, what do we got? Afternoon from LA, nerd to know. <laughs> LA is true, eh? It's 8.30, so six hours behind. Very cool. I'm jealous, by the way. I, I, I usually go to, well, I usually go to LA reasonably often, once a year to go visit my relatives. I have relatives who live in Altadena and, uh, so I, I like I like going out to Dean. I like going to Old Pasadena. It's one of my favorite places. Uh, besides the usual place, besides uh, you know, by Malibu, it's good. That's a nice place. Uh, Mario, as an immigrant, should I stay in Montreal or move to English province to work as program? A few experience in Canada and not French. Well, I, I mean, there's a lot of English jobs you can find in. Montreal, although you're going to have to deal with that French issue. And that's not going to go away. It's very political. Um, you go outside of Quebec and Montreal, you're going to find it's all English. So it, it depends on you. you. You know, I know several friends who left the province because they couldn't take the, the language issue. Others, they were able to manage it. It's up, it's up to you. It depends on you. Uh, do you ever think visual scripting language would ever be as fast as programming languages? I think that uh, the perceived speed will become negligent. negligent. They, they, they'll, they'll, they'll look the same as far as we're concerned because hardware and CPUs are getting so fast. Yes, JavaScript may run 10 times slower than I don't know, Java or C++, whatever. But if it's if it takes one tenth of a second or three tenths of a second, we won't really see the difference. So, and I think at the same time, the higher level languages like the JavaScripts and the PHP are continuing to be, the engines, if you will, are continuing to be uh, evolved. But again, it's a hardware thing. Um, it's just not gonna see it, you know? What else we got here? Uh, uh, Stephen Wisdom has to say, let's say, please, I'm working on a React project and ran into find DOM mode is deprecated. The React docs aren't helping. Please, do you have any suggestions? Sorry, dude, I am not a React coder. I would do a search for that on YouTubes. First of all, deprecation, it's rare that deprecated uh, you know, aspects of a language ever get removed. Like, it could take a decade before something that is deprecated gets uh, removed. That's first of all. That being said, if you're writing new code, you probably shouldn't be using deprecated code. Uh, that's for sure. But like, I, it's rare that deprecated code gets actually discontinued. Trust me on that one. I was looking at, um, I think they're about to release the latest Python 3.8 or something. And uh, there's still, and, 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 there's still not uh, certain aspects of Python 2. They're still not uh, removing yet, even though they were supposed to, and it's like been 12 years or something. Uh, hmm. What was the coolest job you ever had? I don't know. It depends on uh, what you consider cool, you know? Uh, I, like, I like my current business and its iterations uh, over the years. Um, that's, it's been a lot of fun. I don't know. 
my first business I started, it took me on adventures into the jungles of South America, believe it or not. Uh, so that's kind of cool in that regard. Uh, when I was 18 years old, I was a bouncer for a year or two, a year and a half or so. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. Client comes to you and has work done in a language you're not so familiar with. Do you give them the time, a time frame, including how long you think it's going to take you to learn or just turn it down? No, 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 no. Don't turn it down. Take a look at it. In fact, I, I've told a story in the past. One of my first, I think it was my very first full stack client. And it was in a, uh, a variant of Pearl CGI. And I knew like 5% of Pearl CGI, very little. And now the problem with their app, it was a total bloody mess. And they could never get it to work after a year. They could not get it to work. So I was brought in. And it was a full stack, and they had a flat file-based database system that they custom made. And it was a, it was a disaster. And so I came in, looked at it, and I did a and I did a call. I, I I sat down, I looked at it, and then I did some research. I spent a couple of days figuring out what alternate technologies I could use to build this. So first thing I determined that it was better to rewrite from scratch because it was such a mess. And then I looked at, is there any new technologies, any technologies that will allow me to build this thing quickly and efficiently? And fortunately for me, Microsoft had just came out with ASP Classic. I think it was 96. And um, having never worked in the, in the full stack, I'd done front end stuff, but never the full stack, I, I made my best guess and I got the gig. And I, as I, I remember I got my check for the, the advance and I went straight, got the check from the client and I went straight to the bank, cash checked, and then went straight, straight to the bookstore and I bought books on database design, ASP and uh, building apps. And within 30 days, I taught myself how to do all this and I delivered the app and it worked well by following best practices. But I had learned in my previous business, ironically. So I would say do it. All right, so what else is up here? Was there a programming problem that you couldn't solve? Yeah, back in the 90s, um, we didn't have the infrastructure that we have now. Right? You know, certain things you just couldn't do. Certain things you just couldn't do. And I'm trying to think of them. Like, you know, like, Embedding video in a page was like, ugh, it wasn't doable for the most part until later on. Um, I can't think of anything, but yeah, there were just a lot of times when you would, the, the infrastructure just wasn't there and you just couldn't do it, you know? And uh, so that's why the, the web was changing so much so quickly because uh, slowly but surely, uh, companies were building out the infrastructure that allows to do certain things. That's why if you look at the websites from the 1990s, very different today. Uh, not because you know they didn't want to do what we see today, it's just the, the infrastructure was not there, that's all. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Joshua, I appreciate that. Um, so a big, uh, uh, good answer to this. You know, I would say my instinct is Schwartz's because I grew up around Schwartz's. I got like a good 10 pounds of fat still on me from Schwartz's over the last 30 years. But um, Lester's is good too. Lester's is good too. I just, I live near Schwartz's, so I tend to go there. Sebastian Garcias. Uh, Garcias? Garces? I guess. I'm at an odd position working on a startup lead developer of two of a team of two developers, including me. First job as a dev. Company is growing. Not sure if I should stay or look for a more junior role. Nah, nah. Are you, uh, so if you're one of the early developers, you must, you must have some equity, I would hope or imagine, or a possibility of equity in the business. Nah, nah, learn. You don't need to be a junior. Learn. Ask questions. Web seems good for freelancing, but mobile seems good for products. Any suggestions on how to make SaaS product using web technologies? 
I've talked about this, I think, recently, and I've talked about it before. Making a SaaS software as a service for people who don't know, it's not so much about the tech. It's, it's, it's understanding the business. You got you to gotta say, okay, oh, here's an obvious business problem we can solve. And then you say, okay, how, what technology can we use to solve that problem? So a SaaS comes out of um, a problem that you perceive in the market. So a good friend of mine at Paper, they figured that it would be cool to have uh, free tutoring for students in all schools on demand on their phones. That was the premise. So they then started work, looking at what the uh, procedural and software uh, procedural requirements would be and the software requirements would be to solve that problem. And, and so the software, the SaaS evolved out of solving the problem. Does that make sense? So, and they could have went all kinds of directions, but they went in the directions that made sense given the circumstances. How are we doing for time? Oh, well, wow, 46 minutes. All right. I'm going to be ending it off soon. Greetings from Sunrise, Florida. I'm on page 16 of your book, Web Design Start Here. Ah, cool. <laughs> That's cool. I'm glad you, uh, thanks for picking it up. I hope you like it. Um, still relevant today. Greetings from Vienna. Sandro Bern Berners. Dorfer, I recognize your avatar, your icon there. What would you say are the most important big CSS skills? Understanding uh, the CSS cascade, that means understanding the CSS hierarchy, and understanding selector types, the, the standard selector ID class, and uh, um, uh, element selector, or, uh, you know, being able to select individual tags and also the pseudo selectors as well. If you get that, that's a big part of it. And also understanding layout. Um, you can learn the traditional CSS layout, but then you get into grid and uh, flexbox and uh, Bob's your uncle. Any update on bringing the podcast back? I would like to. I would like to. Uh, COVID threw a wrench and everything, kind of busy with a bunch of stuff, but. Now you see I'm slowly stepping up the content, and I'll, uh, I'll set up. I do have the podcast uh, URL, I think, but I think I'll bring it up in audio format at some point again. I like to. I enjoy making the content. What are some obstacles you experience with making Studio Web? Ooh, Boku, Boku obstacles, many obstacles. Um, the biggest obstacle was uh, trying to figure out the subtleties of how the SAS should work so that it was effective for uh, the school situation. Um, something I pointed out in a previous stream, uh, the younger the student, the more skilled you have to be as a course creator and the more uh, advanced the software has to be, the younger the students. Older students, you can be a lousy course creator and, and older students can still understand more or less to a certain extent. But as you go younger, you better be really good. So the hardest thing about Studio Web was finding all those, could be 100, 200 pain points that we eliminated. You know, so if you make, if you change this, change that, change this, change that, uh, in the way the software behaves and, uh, the information it presents to the users. It, what people see in Studio Web as a student is like a very small percentage of the app. It has all kinds of tools, back-end tools for teachers and for uh, administrators. And uh, so there's a, there's a lot of complexity in all that. So there may be uh, 150 little things I lost track. And each one might improve the, uh, the quality of the experience uh, by 0.5%. But, you know, 150 times, it start, starts adding up, right? So it's a process. Studio Web has evolved quite a bit over the last uh, nearly 10 years. Wow. Well. Currently do work for a client that involves a lot of learning. Yeah, for sure. When you're, it's, you know, a big part of being a developer is learning. Learning as you go. 
<laughs> Mikael, market is always full crap. Uh, stock market. On average, how long does it take to learn each language? The first language is the longest. And then uh, once you start, once you've written maybe code for maybe uh, a year or two, then learning uh, subsequent languages get easier and easier and easier. When you, when you have three to four years experience, you could jump into a whole new language and get up to speed within days. Uh, yeah. Can you please suggest project and app ideas to be delivered as a SaaS product? And which one would you do if you ever did? Again, you have to study the business. It's more, it's not, it's business oriented. You know, there might be a SaaS you could build for coffee shops. There might be a SaaS you could build for auto mechanics. There might be a SaaS you could build for plumbers. I don't know. Uh, I currently do work for a client. Okay, I got that one. Black Jaguar, what I like in you, what I like in you that you like us. Oh, yeah, it's cool. It's uh, always fun to get on. Uh, could you do a video on SEO? Yeah, I could do a, a roundup on SEO for sure. It's just time. All right, guys. I'm on a fast right now, um, kind of. What did I eat today? I ate like very little calories today. Uh, I resisted barbecue chicken. So I'm starting to lose my mental faculties. So with that, I think, hello from Nepal. Wow, very cool. I think Rajan, I think you were here last time. All right, guys, that's about it for tonight. Thanks for joining in. And uh, yeah, it's been 15 minutes and we shall see you, I don't know, maybe Monday. We'll talk soon. Ah, uh, there you go. Well, I got to head off. It's nine o'clock for me. Enjoy your evening. Enjoy your weekend, guys.